her at uh, where she was up at her parents up there and bring her home but he asked that we have special prayer for her so let's pause right now and, and pray for terry and uh miss brewer would you like to lead that prayer for it Amen. I'm, I've got a little bit of ring on mine, Greg. Turn me. Yeah. This one here, you think that's what's doing it? I don't know. Turn it the wrong way. Like spin the bottle. <laughs> we'll spin it and whoever that points at you have to come up and speak. How about that? That'd be an interesting service, wouldn't it? Uh, yeah. Brother Jimmy Riley is pastor down the street at Grace Baptist, and he's one of our boys, one old Southside young, and it grew up at the same time. He's about two years behind me in age, but uh, numerous uh, people from that early years ended up in the ministry. And I think of him, and I think of others that are in the ministry. I think of Glenn and Cheryl. They've been singing and playing gospel music along with the, you know, with different bands and here for since we were teenagers, hadn't we? And I was thinking about that a minute ago, and had a birthday, another birthday, brother. <laughs> it's past, I, I'm not going to tell him what, but it's past 6 0. <laughs> but uh, we're still kicking, aren't we, brother? And uh, I thank God for faithful brothers and friends, sisters, brothers, friends that have uh, stayed with it. Still serving Jesus after all these years. I was watching the uh, baptism up at Camp Anderson uh, this week. We had one from here. Johnny Plummer, a little that goes to early service, was baptized and asked me to come baptize him. And there were like 26 or 27, 30, something like that, baptized that day. And I was thinking all those little lives being touched there in the Swanee River. And I thought back to when I was a young man uh, as a, of a pre-elementary uh, right in there, probably second grade, third grade, went to Camp on the Swanee. You ever heard of that? Anybody heard of Camp on the Swanee? But it, used to, it was up by O'Brien, and uh, the, all the Southern Baptist churches in this area would send their youth. So you remember? She's shaking her head, yeah. And uh, I remembered as a kid, they had, it was similar to Camp Anderson, what they're doing now. And lots and lots of young people made decisions to follow the Lord Jesus Christ and committed their lives to Him. And, and as I thought about it, almost all the leaders of the, the churches in Gilchrist and Levy and all the way over into the edge of Gainesville went to camp on the Swanee. All the old people that are now older than me and they're starting to kind of pass off the scene. They've carried the torch all these years. You know, and, and now God's raising up some brand new little lives that are being touched. And, and uh, hopefully... They'll, they'll hear, hear and heed the call of God, and they'll serve God with their lives like we have done. You know, I tell you what, it's been fun serving the Lord. And uh, we, we've had a wonderful time uh, walking with Him and uh, following along behind the spiritual leaders we've had here. And thank God, uh, Miss Brewers and some of those are still with us, still going strong, still teaching. And uh, Mr. Brother Jerry Melton and Pastor Gene, that was in the early service, are mentors of, in the faith, and we thank God for them. And... Uh, as you hear about these others, you know, Jimmy and his wife there, always remember that, you know, we're not in competition with the other churches. You know, if they love the Lord Jesus and they're preaching the gospel. I'm, we're on the same page, same team. Might just be a different building, but we love the Lord and, and we're of the same body of Christ. So we need to continually pray for them, pray for, for their church and pray for, for Terry to get well. <clears throat> and also continue to pray for Miss Norma. Is Miss Norma faring well, Brother Jerry? Yes, sir. Yeah. Amen. God's grace will, will, and, and our brother back from the edge of the grave with us today. How are you doing? Is he healing up? Yes, sir. Amen. Good. Had a bad motorcycle accident, but here he is live and, and, all, and answer your prayers. There's one of them right there. You know, if we were to write down all of our answers to prayers in our lifetime, we would have tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of answered prayers, wouldn't we? So maybe we need to start writing those things down like uh, Pastor Emeritus has been telling us to do these years, huh? Yeah. Amen. 
those of you that know me and, and hang around me very much might know this part of my personality, but I'm the one in the family that when we go on a hunting trip or fishing trip, I'm the, I pack a lot of stuff. You know, I prep, okay, because when I don't like to be cold, wet, or hungry. And I've been all three many times as a child, and, and I made up my mind. When I got old enough to do something about that, Bill Keith, when we, we went anywhere, is going to be warm. <laughs> I'm going to have some tools with me. If the thing breaks down, I'm going to have some food and water to drink and eat if, if, we, if times get rough. And, and many, many times that's carried the load, hadn't it, Miss Vani, on trips and stuff? You need to tell them about the trip that my dad laughed at. Yeah, yeah. We went to bury Bonnie's grandmother up uh, one Christmas, Christmas season. It was in December, and we normally don't go to Ohio in December. It's not a good time to go to Ohio, by the way. But we, we needed to because her grandmother had passed away, and we were going up to do the funeral and be with them. And we borrowed Dad's uh, four-wheel drive Suburban. So I packed my coveralls. I packed my, I packed my extra gloves, my sweatshirts, my extra tools, and I, I loaded, I had my stuff, okay? Whatever would go wrong, Mr. Bill Keith had it ready to fix it. If, and her daddy laughed and laughed and laughed. And numerous times on the way, I had to get out and do stuff on that van. And we, we were in a, a blizzard across those, through the mountains of Kentucky, you know how it gets up on 75, that we saw 26 accidents. And we creeped along there at 35 miles an hour for about two or three miles or two or three hours and uh, finally made it through there on the way back it blizzard hit us again same area all through there you know and the top of the mountains you know and we, but we made it home safe but he never laughed at me after that did he they, they they mocked and ridiculed till somebody had to get out and work on the van guess guess it was warm I didn't get cold I didn't get wet I had my waterproof stuff and my gloves and yeah stop at every Walmart to buy an extra they did. I had all my stuff, but they had to stop somewhere and buy stuff along the way. No, not me. I was prepared, you know. But uh, we're talking about being prepared, and, and the, the scripture that we'll go to in a minute, I'll give it to you in just a second. But as we think about this, be thou prepared, uh, it's equipping the church for persecution in times of trouble. Recently, uh, Brother Terry and myself and John and Nancy and who else? Fred, I think, took the, the CERT training. We, we took the uh, citizens emergency response training and we got certified we're certified yeah sanctified but we're certified too but uh, you get a actually we have a FEMA certification so if it gets bad with it let us through the checkpoints to, to help people we have our little green helmets and stuff but it, it taught us how to deal with emergencies and help law enforcement and help other emergency response people we can even triage when we get there, set up the triage for them and that kind, that kind of thing. But we did that on purpose because there's coming a time we might need that. And we, we may have that training in our church at some point. If, if we have that, please do it. Even if you're a young person, take that training, get certified in it. And, uh, because we all need to be prepared. We need to equip our people to help in times of persecution, which might come to America, but also in times of trouble. A book I read recently kind of spurred me on in this area, and I, I designed a sermon series off of this because I kind of sprung board off of 2 Timothy 3. We talked about the perilous times a couple of weeks ago that I preached to you, and uh, I want to springboard off of that into this series on being prepared and what that means to the church. But uh, if you are a reader, if you like to read, how many of you are readers? Uh, this is a good book. You can get it on Kindle. I'm going to order some paper copies, paperback copies that won't be uh, as expensive as the hardbacks, but I'll have some here maybe next week, week after. Uh, but if you have Kindle, you might want to go ahead and download it. But it's an awesome series, and I'm basing what I'm sharing with you uh, through this series on this pastor's wonderful book called Be Thou Prepared. Now, Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 7, the context of this passage is, is, deals with when later in history when Russia and her allies come down and uh, come against Israel. Some of the latter-day prophecies that are there in Ezekiel. But this one verse just jumps off the page at me and at us during our period of, life, our, our period of history because we live in dangerous times. How many think we nearly live in some dangerous times? Uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 7 Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee and be thou a guard unto them. 
be thou a guard unto them. I hope as a pastor that I can be the kind of pastor that will always issue words of warning when I think there's danger. Words of caution when I think that there's, you know, we're heading in the wrong direction. Words of comfort and, and that sort of thing when you need them. You know, words of admonition, words of rebuke at times. But I always want to be the kind of, of watchdog that is not a, a silent watchdog, but one that will actually sound the alarms if I see things that we need to worry about. And, and I really think that the being prepared is something we need to think about. That we all need this this in our minds. But uh, let's begin with prayer again as we think about being prepared for whatever may come in our future. Lord, I pray today that, that I don't come across as some wild-eyed, backwoods radical, Lord, that's uh, like a lot of the people have become these days, Lord, and people scoff and laugh at them. But Lord, that you'll help me to have a calmness of spirit, calmness of speech, so that I can uh, caution our brothers and sisters that we need to be prepared at all times. Because number one, Lord, we don't know what day you're coming. And you tell us to be prepared for that. But also, Lord, we need to be living as if you're coming every day. So help us, Lord, to be prepared. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I want to read an excerpt of what happened at, uh, in a little incident at Katrina that might shock you. Shocked me when I read it. But uh, I know it probably is, is just a tip of the iceberg of what really happened to some of the people there. And the, and the title of it is, It Happened Before and It Could Happen Again. That's how a now famous resident of New Orleans, Louisiana, known as Zettown, in, ends his harrowing true story. Most people could never guess how his biz bizarre story began. On August the 29th, 2005, Hurricane Katrina plowed through the Gulf Coast with its most destructive fury reserved for the city of New Orleans. On that fateful day, the city's massive levee system was breached and wave upon wave of frothy water rushed into the city and the surrounding area, flooding homes and turning streets into deadly canals and every low spot into a potential death pit. Some places were over 20 feet underwater. The levees had been designed to withstand a Category 3 hurricane. Katrina slammed into the Gulf Coast as a Category 5. Over 80% of New Orleans was submerged. Within days, normal societal living collapsed, right in the middle of one of America's oldest and most celebrated cities. Those blessed to have survived the ordeal found themselves living in an upended and surreal world immediately devoid of justice, protection, government, laws, and much less simple matters of respect and day-to-day -day human decency. Food and clean water were at a premium. Emergency medical care was non-existent. The chances of living until the next day became questionable, even doubtful for many. Just a few days before, life had been completely normal. Now the city resembled a third world war zone. Several days before the storm hit the Gulf Coast, Zatuan had sent his wife Kathy and his children to stay with the relative, his relatives in Texas, saying he would stay behind to protect the family's home and personal property. He never dreamed he would soon be caught in a nightmare, one that haunts his family to this day. In the days of the storm's aftermath, Zatoin paddled his old canoe, which had miraculously survived the storm, through the deadly street canal, seeking to offer assistance to neighbors who might be injured, stranded, or worse. Predictably, Zatoin discovered plenty of people in need. He found them clinging for life to any object they could grab. Some were floating in the water, others were injured, hungry, and sick. He helped however he could, rescuing a Baptist pastor and his wife, and even allowing a stranger to live in his home for shelter. He is credited for saving or rescuing at least ten people who were in desperate need. God left me here for a reason, he said. I did what I was brought up to do. Then, six days after the storm hit, his life took an outlandish twist. Zatoin was on the phone in his own home talking with his mother or his brother who lived in Syria. Suddenly the front door burst open and a group of men in military fatigues and bulletproof vests leveled M16s and automatic pistols at him. They demanded his identification papers. He explained to them that he was in his own home and that he was a business owner in the city, but that did not seem to matter. Soon he found himself under arrest and carted away in cuffs. 
He was taken to a government holding facility that had been constructed using a Greyhound bus terminal. He was placed in a fenced holding cage. Eight armed military guards equipped with assault rifles and security dogs surrounded him and the other prisoners. Prisoners. Satoyan was, was kept incarcerated at the bus station and was allowed no phone calls. Meanwhile, his wife Kathy went into a state of a deep state of deep despair. For two weeks, she received no word from her husband. She concluded that he was probably dead. Finally, on September the 19th, Kathy learned of her husband's detention when she received a call from a missionary who told her he had seen Zatoin in prison. <clears throat> Zatoin was in prison for almost a month before he was finally released on $75,000 bond or bail for having looted his own home. Eventually, the charges were dropped. Kathy has since been diagnosed with symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, including memory loss and dizziness. She says, Katrina was a re great reality slap. slap. I was naive before. I felt I had things under control. But I've come to the conclusion that I don't control anything. I'm in control of nothing. When a reporter from the UK's Guardian asked Zatoin if he feared another Katrina scenario, he replied, It happened before. It could happen again. The final death toll of Hurricane Katrina was 836 people. Today, 705 additional people are still reported as missing. Kind of scary, huh? And, and this is not a sermon to try to freak you out and scare you and make you run out of here going, oh, we've got to be preppers. No, it's not what this is all about. But it is a, is a message about being prepared and the question that we all have to ask is, you know, are we, are we prepared? The Word of God says in Proverbs 22, verse 3, A prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Well, that's certainly true, isn't it? A prudent person foresees danger and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. And the question I'd like to ask you today, are we really prepared? <laughs> Are we really prepared? With all that's happening today in the world and on the news, it's a pretty valid question, isn't it? And it's a question that we need to ask ourselves. And you, you might be thinking, oh, you're not one of these prepper sermons, you know. Prepared for what, Pastor? Well, prepared for any number of scenarios that could happen. We don't know exactly what's going to happen. But we know that the end times and, the, and our times are dangerous times, perilous times, the Bible talked about. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 42, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. Now the context there, of course, is, is relating to the coming of Christ and the fact that Jesus wanted all of us to be ready for that. Uh, however, it's in the day-to-day -day living that you and I live in every day. As we watch for the Lord's return, we need to have a life of being prepared at all times. How many of you think we need to be prepared for His coming? But see, in, in order to be prepared for His coming, we have to be prepared for what He said was going to accompany His coming. A lot of bad stuff's coming. He said it, He told us, so we, don't, we, we haven't been without warning. We've already been warned that, that bad times probably are coming our way. And uh, as we think about preparedness in the early church, in the early days of Christianity, the members of the early church, even while it was still in its infancy, they soon learned the need to protect one another. They learned the fact that they had to provide for one another, minister to one another, and uh, provide basic needs for each other during that period of time. You might remember there was uh, a lot of hunger during the early church. They had to help feed one another. You know, there were times they took up collections to people that were having the, uh, famines in different areas. They had to feed the widows and the orphans. There was a dispute when they elected deacons. Remember, it was all about trying to take care of people and feed them on a daily basis. They, uh, they had great times of physical persecution, which the church was under attack. And folks, we don't see it here as much. Uh, we, we do see it in, in the other parts of the world right now. The Coptic Christians in Syria probably will no longer exist in the next couple of years. There's so many been killed by ISIS and they're trying to, to kill all the Coptic Christians in that whole part of Syria. Uh, our church is under attack today. Christians like you and I are under attack all over the world and hadn't hit us yet. 
but it certainly could at some point. Uh, natural disasters, you know, there are all sorts of things. Uh, the one in, in the book of Acts where it talked about the, the prophet Abacus or whatever his name was prophesied the, the famine was coming and they needed to prepare and that sort of thing. See, God has warned us about these things. The early church was a church of preparedness. You know, they were, they were prepared and, and uh, we are descendants of that early community of believers. The legacy of preparedness is, is our responsibility to faithfully carry on. It's part of our legacy. Just like the early church, it's no different. Uh, the, a lot of the problem is many Christians today, many churches have buried their head in the sand and they use the, the, the terminology, we need to just trust the Lord and not worry about those things. And it's really, they're, they're like ostriches putting their head in the sand. Listen, we live in troubling times and perilous times. Uh, multitudes may never come to the Lord Jesus as their Savior and Lord unless we first sheltered them in times of bad times or fed them or helped them when they were down and out. Uh, I love the, the idea that you have, my sister. Thank you for helping us be involved in that backpack program. No telling what the end result of that will be. No telling what will happen with those Bibles that are placed there. With your messages going into homes that have never heard the name of Countryside Baptist Church, never heard the name of Christ probably in many cases. No telling what's going to happen in the long run, in the, in the, in the eternity of things. We, there's, we're going to have a great, a great impact by doing those sort, sort of things. But uh, multitudes may never come to the Savior unless the church is prepared and is involved. I know that down in, in uh, when Hurricane Charlie hit South Florida and down around Bell Glade in that area and tore up that whole area and uh, I mean destroyed whole communities, destroyed the, the power structure, the people don't know this, the power lines, the big ones knocked them down. There was nothing. It was devastation. And a lot of churches that weren't hit by the storm, weren't hurt, they closed their doors, padlocked it, and put no trespassing signs on their church. A lot of churches. Supposedly Christ-loving, sin, sinner-loving churches that, that love this lost and dying world, they closed their doors when, when, the, when the community needed them. But the Southern Baptist churches of that area opened their doors. And the Southern Baptist Convention, through the disaster relief program that you helped support, we, we support the Southern Baptist Convention and part of our, our money that goes in our plate goes to, to fund those things. The first people in normally are the Southern Baptists. It's weird, isn't it? Think of Southern Baptists. What do we do good? We do that real well. When, when uh, Sandy tore up New Jersey and New York, guess who the first people were there? Southern Baptists. The feeding units and the, the rescue units. The Southern Baptists were first on the scene. The same way at, in, at Charlie. Our guys, came, they just rose up to the occasion. And we had people from Harmony that went down. And when they came back and gave their reports, I was listening there in awe and I'm thinking, man, well, I wish I could have been there, you know. Lord, if, could, could we be that kind of church that would open our doors if something like that were to happen and our community needed us? Would we be that kind of church? Or will be the kind of church we have the kind of people that will close and lock themselves in and put no dress and passing signs up? I shared with our people at Otter Creek that night. I said, I, I hope we're never like that. I said, I hope that if that ever would ever happen here, we would be ready. Little did I know that the hurricanes from hell would come and we'd have four in a row. And I'll share with you later what we were able to do there in the little town of Otter Creek to minister people that had never been in our church before. People that I tried to witness to, tried to talk to, would not even open their door to me. We ended up having to feed them, love on them, clothe them for two weeks or so. And after that, they love me. <laughs> they love our people. They love our church. They eat out of our hand when we want to tell them something about the Lord Jesus. And many of them came to Christ. But it didn't happen until we were prepared like the early church was to minister and meet the needs of people around us. You see, it's, it's one thing to, to be like the monks and withdraw up into the mountains and chant and look at, stare at your navel and chant, you know, and with, keep yourself holy before the Lord. Or you get down and get among the people like Jesus did. Jesus was among the people where they were where the hurting and dying and sick were. That's where Jesus wanted to be, you know. And that's where God has placed us. He's placed us in a, in a lost city called Gainesville, full of sin and vice. You know, full of, full of all sorts of stuff that would curl your hair if we were to talk about it, that sinful type things. But you know what? We're here on purpose. 
God put us here. We're, we're here to bring grace here. Grace wins every time, as they sang early, early this morning. Uh, our legacy is to carry on the preparedness of the early church. Uh, Romans 8.22 is still true. It says, For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Listen, the creation has, is still fallen. People are still sinners. <laughs> it's getting worse. <laughs> but you know what? I don't, I don't let that worry me. I'm, I get excited because I think the, the coming of the Lord's near. But in the meantime, we get to minister to people. We go, oh no, it's terrible. It's, no. Praise God. It's, you know, it's almost here. Jesus is almost here. And, it, and, and I get to minister to people and help people. You know, that's how we need to look at it. We have an opportunity, just like Brother Terry and others that took that training. We have an opportunity to, to reach out and help people in times like this. Now, in co some important questions we need to answer as we think about these things. And I want to motivate you today. This is the first part of this series to motivate you to think, start thinking in this area of being prepared and what that means. Uh, and the question, is the church prepared to meet the emergency needs in, of our members and others? Are we really prepared? Now, we're a little prepared, but we're not, we're not yet prepared like we need to be. You know, there are things we need here that we don't even have yet that I want to have in place for emergencies and that sort of thing. But we do have some pretty good personnel. I remember at Otter Creek when a lady came in front and had a, had a massive heart attack and died on the altar. I mean, right there, died in my arms. But we had, we had emergency personnel within about, we had three trucks within 10 minutes and a chopper within 10 minutes. That's how fast they came in the middle of nowhere. And I know it would probably be pretty quick here. But we have people here that have some pretty good training. We have medic How many of you are medically trained here? Medical personnel. Raise your hand for a minute. Look around. Bill, you're medically trained. Raise your hand. Let's look at all the medical people. Look, well, i got one, two, three, four. Right here, four. Miss Betty's a nurse. We've got, you know, uh, early search. We have a, two doctors. So we're, <laughs> we're, we're pretty good shape in that regard. So, but there are other things we need to have in place for emergencies. And the question is, the church prepared? Well, I hope we, hope we are and I hope we get better at that. Second thing, does the church really need to spend its precious resources preparing and planning for tough times? Or simply, should it just trust God? I think part of what we should spend our money on is being prepared, don't you? Since Jesus has warned us, since God has told us in the Bible we need to be prepared, it's not, a, it's not being a, having a lack of faith doing that. Third thing, what is the church's responsibility of meeting the needs of the world around it? Now, the reason that the welfare system is what it is today, you know why it is what it is today? Because the churches didn't do what they should have done. And people that were that had food and, and resources didn't do what they were supposed to do with what they had. Did you know there's a welfare system in the Bible? Did you know every farmer had an obligation? When you, if you had a field, say this is your field, you could not harvest the corners. And when you harvested it, you couldn't harvest it clean. You had to leave little pieces in there. You know why you had to leave it for that? For the poor people that didn't have food. They could come on your property without your permission and eat your food because God said they could. But it was, you had designated areas. You see, God had a, had a, play, a plan in place. We just didn't use it, and now our government's taking it over. And, uh, and, and Christians say, well, we pay our taxes, let them do it, kind of thing, you know. Well, what is the church's responsibility of meeting the needs of the world around it? We need to think about that, and we'll talk about that some more later. Should not the church be focused, number four there, on winning the lost more focused on winning the loss than on implementing social programs. Should we be more concerned about that? Uh, what about the church's responsibility to take care of its own? Do you think it talks about taking care of our own? Do you think it talks about taking care of widows in our church? Huh? Yeah? And, and orphans? <laughs> I think there's, we have a big responsibility, don't we? Uh, and shouldn't these considerations about taking care of your own come first? Yeah. Uh, see, individual Christian churches and entire denominations, we struggle with these issues and these thoughts. We need to think these things through. And there are many more questions like this we need to worry about and think about. Or not worry in the sense of worry, but think about them and, and ponder them. Uh, next one. Should a church be concerned about security during services? Should we have an armed guard with a, a visible weapon on campus? Do, should we carry uh, concealed weapons to protect you? 
Hey, that's a good question, isn't it? We're not going to tell you whether we do or not. But we do. <laughs> we don't have a visible one, but, but we may. Who knows? We're, as we talk about this, we'll clarify our security deal more and more. We have a, a group working on that. I'll put it that way. We have a group working on that right now and, think, and trying to design this thing so it should be done right. Uh, number, next one. Should a church or a Christian family overly concern itself with making survival prepping plans for emergency situations? Should we? Uh, yeah, that's overly concerned, you know. Well, you know, the, uh, the Mormon denomination, they have a massive amount of prepping already done in place. I mean, they are, they are prepared, you know, and I think the Baptists are way behind them uh, in, in this area, and a whole lot of the other people just mock and ridicule people that do prep a little bit, you know, so we need to think about that. Uh, should a family, uh, you know, do that? What normally happens is the ones that prepare, the ones that don't come in and want to use it all up, once they, they haven't been smart, you know. That's what happens with me a lot of times, the ones that don't take anything on our trips, fishing trips. They want to eat all the food I brought since they don't bring it, but they know Bill Keith prepped. <laughs> and that's, sometimes that happens in churches, doesn't it? And we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the freeloaders and the, and the charlatans that come along and try to abuse the good conscience of churches and the good the hospitality of churches. That happens a lot. We're going to talk about that. Uh, so the question, should we prepare? You know, there are biblical responses to all those questions, and we're going to be looking at them over the next couple of weeks. Uh, the experience of the early church provides us with several models of response that we're going to examine. How did the early church handle this? They had the same kind of situations, you know, different uh, age, but same kind of problems because it's were people problems. Uh, to, the, so to the foundational question, should the church make common sense preparations for unforeseen emergencies and the possibility of tough times that comes, the biblical answer is a resounding what? Yes. yes. Say it with me one time. Yes. yes, we should. See, it was the hallmark of the early church. They were ready. They were prepared and they helped one another in times of need. Uh, they, the, uh, secondly, the prudent preparation or prudent preparation is a part of a normal person's everyday life. Okay? Think about it. You ask, what's too much? All right? Good question, isn't it? Well, let me ask you a question. Do you wear a seatbelt when you drive? Why? Why didn't you just trust God? Do you, uh, do you uh, put seatbelts on your children when you get in the car? Do you, do you strap yours in? Why? Law says we have to, but why else? It's the responsibility to pre to prep for that. So he's prepping. Okay. Do you uh, do you have uh, smoke alarms or burglar alarms in your home? Who has any? Raise your hand for me. Why do you do that? Why don't you just trust God? Uh, do you have locks on your home? Raise your hand if you have a lock on your home. Why not just leave it open and trust God? You see, you see the you ha people that don't want to prepare. They can't. They lose that real quick. That argument. Uh, Bill, really, because my wife would call DCF. <laughs> you called DCF on you again. That's true. Uh, now, do any of you have insurance policies? Raise your hand if you have insurance. Why do you have insurance? Why don't you just trust God? Now, the reason you do is you're prudent. You're smart. You're you're pre you're pre you're prepping. You know, you're preparing for something, right? And it, and it's it's a safeguard against the future, that sort of thing. Uh, See, so if you answered yes to any or all those questions, you know, then you have the answer for you. So why do we need to prep? We all, we all prep already, don't we? You know, the truth, is in our every, the truth is in our everyday activities in our lives, we are in constant state of preparing, planning, and protecting. And it shouldn't be any different than the church, right? So think about that. Is preparedness a measure of faith? See, there are a lot of people, that believers, that say, well, you just need to trust God. Y'all you, worry too much. And all y'all do is talk about that stuff. And you, you just need to trust God. You're not trusting God. No, it's not. It's not not trusting God to do that. It's not a measurement of, of faith. Uh, the Bible says we walk by faith and not by sight. I understand that. But see, that same Bible talks all through there about be thou prepared. And, you know, every time that something was happening in the Bible, anything bad that was coming, God always warned his people 
Many times he would do it in a dream or an angel or some way he would warn his people through a vision or a, or a, a whatever. You, count, you can count a bunch of them in the, in the Word of God when God warned his people what was coming. Uh, he warned Joseph, didn't he? What did Joseph have to do with baby Jesus? Took off to Egypt. How did, how did he know? Well, God warned him and he prepared and he, he got the heck out of Dodge, as they say. He went to Egypt. You know, and did what God told him to do. See, the issue is not a matter of having enough faith or trusting God. It's not the issue. Uh, especially when you, when you hear the commands in God's Word to faithfully prepare. See, God's told us to. He tells us to, to do that. And, uh, so really the issue is not so much should we prepare. The focus on, should be on how much we should prepare. Now what is, how much is too much, as Ms. Brewer said, you know. Uh, how should we respond? To, uh, how, how should today's church effectively and bibli biblically prepare to take care of its own as well as the world around it? How, sh how should we prepare? Uh, we're going to be talking about those things. Should we store up for tough days ahead? I know people that have whole, like the Y2K. I know people, my granddaddy was one of them, you know, that this, they went wild on that stuff. And I don't know whatever happened to all that rice and beans they stored. I hope it's hope it didn't rot, but there was a bunch of it, you know. But you see, it's a little different now than, than it was then. We didn't have near what we had going on then that we have now. So times have sure changed. Uh, what, if we, what if war should come to our soil? God forbid. I think we're already in the, the beginnings of almost a civil war. You know, God forbid it, it, it get to a shooting war. But it's happened all over the world. And, you know, God spared us so far. I pray He still spares us, but what about Syria and all the Christians there? You know, and, and Iran, Iraq. There are lots of Christians there. The Christians that have lived through wars and World War II, World War I, all the European Christians had to live through all that stuff. And who knows that we might not in the future. So we need to be smart enough to be prepared should that happen. Now, as we conclude today, we're going to look deeper into this subject of uh, being prepared. We'll look at biblical examples from the Old Testament and New Testament as to how uh, these things should should they happen. But but I want to say to you, relax, okay? Calm down, relax. Everybody take a deep breath. We're alive, everything's cool, nothing's happened, we're good, okay? Y'all, everybody good? Raise your hand, you good? All right, we're good. It, it, this, this is not... Uh, this series in this book that I base this on is not written by some scaremongering, wild-eyed, bearded survivalist somewhere in the woods. No, it's written by a pastor that was concerned about his church being prepared. And, and it, it meant so much to me, I'm going to share it with you. Uh, he's a longtime senior pastor and a former Florida law enforcement officer, so it's not written by a nut. This is written by a legitimate person. And I'm just going to build the sermon series off of what he's written. I'll probably send it to him when I'm through and uh, let him use it if he wants to borrow my... Mine might not be as good as his, his are, but I want to share three truths as we close. Three truths to ponder. Number one, planning ahead for potential disasters and crisis situations is not a sign of faithlessness. Rather, it is the wisdom to be faithful with what God has entrusted to us. See, it's not faithlessness. It's actually you're showing a lot of faith and you're showing the wisdom of God. Second thing, even if one never needs to implement disaster or emergency preparation procedures, the very act of planning for them creates an atmosphere of integrity, thoughtfulness, and life lessons for others. Our children are watching. How, how are you? How is my daddy and my mama prepared for this situation? And other people will see you and understand. Number three, the act of planning thinking ahead and aggressively preparing for the potential of tough times and it is a specifically biblical and godly activity in which each church and each Christian family should be involved. You see, everybody here should be involved in it. It's a good thing. It's a godly thing. We're not weird. We're not strange because we want to be prepared. So as we think about these things, uh, I want to stir your thoughts and stir your imaginations and, and stir your spirits so that we can be a church that's prepared. And thank God we already have some folks that are, that are ahead of us walking point, such as our CERT team. It's already, we've already taken, how many weeks did that take us, brother? Nine weeks? 
nine weeks we went to school to be cert certified for you. And we hope, we hope to get a few more of you cert certified. We have life, uh, we have f firemen here that have all sorts of skills. So we, we're, we're somewhat prepared. We want to be better prepared. Amen? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the word. And Lord, it warns us so many times to be prepared. Lord, that's what we're trying to do. Give us wisdom as we go. Help us not to be uh, foolish and rash, but all, just to be calm, collected, and full of wisdom as we plan whatever you show us to do, Lord. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Brother Mark, what are we singing? Take my life and let it be. If you're here today and you have any sort of issue you'd like to talk about, maybe pray about, uh, we'd love to speak with you afterwards and uh, we'll be around for a good while. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, really in reality that's the ultimate prepping. You want to be ready for eternity. You don't want to go to hell when you die. We can show you how to avoid hell and how to have a great life here on this earth. You come see us afterwards and we'll share that with you. Let's see. Let's stand as we sing. Amen.